This video will be on transgenics and genetic engineering. So first I'll talk about transgenics. So a transgenic organism is a organism that has an exogenous gene that has been added to its genome. So what that means is that it is, it is not its own gene, it is an extra gene that has been inserted into the genome. Transgenic organisms can be made in many different types of organisms and there are a variety of different ways that these are created. In mice, for example, you actually take a little bit of that DNA and you inject it into a fertilized embryo. Whereas in Drosophila, people have figured out ways to get transgenic pieces of DNA inserted into a genome by using transposons. Irregardless of the way that these organisms were created, the important thing is that that extra piece of DNA has to be inserted into the chromosome of that individual so that it can be inherited when that cell divides and in fact it can even be inherited to the next generation. That piece of DNA that is inserted must have its own regulatory sequences if you want it to be transcribed. So I'd just like to talk about a few different possible uses for transgenic organisms. I'd like to highlight things that are not transgenics to start out with. So some of the things that are not transgenic involve genetic manipulation nevertheless. And so, for example, humans have selectively bred different crops and different animals, for example, this, this dog here, um, to select for various traits. And those would not be considered transgenic, even though they are modifying the genome of that organism. And the reason is, is because it's done by breeding. It's not done by inserting a exogenous gene. Also, we've talked about changing the number of chromosome sets. So for example, the historic version of a banana has seeds and this would be a diploid banana and bananas that are used for food are actually intentionally made to be triploid so they do not make seeds and they are much better for eating. One big use for transgenic organisms is in research and we have learned so many different things by making transgenic organisms and I'll just highlight one particular thing that can be done. So the green fluorescent protein which we've used before in this class is a naturally fluorescent molecule that uh, if you shine the correct wavelength of light on will fluoresce green. And scientists have used GFP to make a transgenic organism so that we can connect GFP to different proteins of interest in the cell. This allows us to observe the a living cell without killing it first and it allows us to observe such things as transport of cargo throughout the cell, mitosis, the process of chromosomes separating from each other, and other really beautiful things. There are a few videos here if you're interested in looking at them. Another use for genetically modified organisms has been in crops. So um, here's one particular one which has been really interesting in my lifetime. It used to be that if you bought sweet corn for um, eating corn on the cob in the summertime that almost every single ear had this horrible these horrible worms which is called the European corn borer and this was really a terrible pest of corn and it Actually, it was estimated that about 7% of the world's corn production was lost to this pest in the past. These days, if you purchased corn in the summertime, you don't see those worms anymore on the ends of the ears. And that is because the corn that is grown now is mostly what is called Bt corn. This particular corn has a transgene inserted into the genome that makes this particular protein called Bt, which actually kills insects when they eat it. And that particular uh, protein has no effect on humans and other mammals. 
Another thing that people have used genetically modified organisms for is for nutrient addition. And so there is this huge problem worldwide with vitamin A deficiency in young children. Uh, sometimes that can actually lead to death and sometimes it can lead to blindness. These are somewhat old figures, but it just estimates some of the problems from the World Health Organization that come from vitamin A deficiency. And so there are scientists who thought that maybe we could actually fix this by making a more nutritious version of rice. And so rice actually has the ability to make vitamin A, to produce vitamin A, um, except it has a few genes missing that are required for it to actually turn this on in the kernel of the rice. And so this organization has actually tried to make this rice and they've been very successful at making this rice that turns on these two required genes in the grain and therefore the grain becomes much more nutritious and it actually turns yellow as a result. Now, this is kind of a sad story because there's a really altruistic group of scientists that have been behind this effort, this many, many years effort. And the problem is that it has really not been well accepted. And so the look of the rice is different and there's just been low acceptance in general of genetically modified organisms, even though it is solving an important worldwide health concern. So I'd just like to end this section by saying that I wish we could have a little discussion and that's what I would normally do in class. But a lot of people have raised concerns about GM crops and others are very much for them. And so this is definitely an area where our scientific knowledge can be useful for uh, non-scientists. One thing that I would just say is that there are some fraudulent studies out there. And so there are some studies that show that, for example, mice that eat genetically modified crops get lots of tumors and no one has been able to ever replicate those results. And so that is really thought to be a fraudulent um, science, but it is out there and it's a commonly quoted uh, reason to be against genetically modified organisms. In my opinion, there are some reasons to be concerned, reasons of allergenicity, questions of how a genetically modified organism might coexist in natural environments and whether they might actually start out competing naturally occurring populations. Another question that has been a very long standing question is whether we can actually make transgenics in humans. And specifically, the question has come up because individuals are affected with these terrible genetic disorders. For example, they may have a mutation in the cystic fibrosis gene and they have two mutant copies. And if you could just deliver a good copy of that gene to the appropriate cells in that individual, they may be cured of their condition. Now usually in order to get a transfer gene incorporated into every cell in an organism, you actually have to start at that fertilized zygote stage and that is generally not possible in humans. However, uh, people have looked into transferring genes only into the cells of interest, the, the cells that really matter for the phenotypes of the disorder they are experiencing. There have been recent um, exciting advances in human gene therapy, but this has been a very, very long standing area of research and there have been a lot of setbacks along the way. I think it illustrates some of the challenges of introducing new technologies to treat human diseases. I'm just going to tell you about very briefly about two examples, uh, kind of sad failed examples of gene therapy. The very first gene therapy examples were actually for some kids who had SCID. And so this is a disorder in which these children essentially don't have a functioning immune system. 
And this was done in 1995. And the idea is that this one gene that they were missing, maybe we could actually transfer it using a virus into hematopoietic stem cells or blood stem cells, and then put those, those um, fixed cells back into the patient. Initially, it seemed that these kids were actually cured of their disorder. However, a number of years later, several of the children all got a certain specific type of leukemia. And the problem arose was actually because this, this uh, replacement gene that was inserted via this virus was actually selectively inserting right near a gene and causing that gene to become activated. That gene turned out to be an oncogene, and it was actually forcing those replacement cells into cell division, and that's why these children eventually got leukemia. Another really sad example happened in 1999. This was a individual, a young man named Jesse Gelsinger. He had a, a metabolic disorder in which his liver essentially is not making an important enzyme. This was actually a treatable disorder and he was in relatively good health um, just using his medications that were available and a special diet. This was actually at the University of Pennsylvania when I was actually a student there. So I experienced firsthand what a kind of a devastating situation this was. So he was recruited for this clinical trial for a gene therapy and his liver was injected with viruses which had the replacement gene and they hoped that the virus would infect his liver cells and his liver cells would then be able to make this gene ornithine transcarbamylase, which he was missing. However, he had a pretty severe reaction to uh, that treatment, and he actually died about four days after the treatment. And this was a big wake-up call for all of the people in the entire country that were doing gene therapy. In retrospect, it was discovered that he uh, did not have a clear understanding of the risks that were associated with this experimental treatment. And there are some questions about the consent and the choice of a relatively healthy person to be in such a, an experimental trial for a treatment. So this one case really brought gene therapy to a halt for a number of years. More recently, there was the very first gene therapy that was approved by the FDA to fix a defective gene, and this was approved in December 2017. The name of this is called Luxturna, and this is actually a, um, a treatment to fix a genetic form of blindness, which is called Labor's congenital amaurosis. And uh, it's a mutation where you have two mutant copies of this particular gene, RPE65. So the wild type gene is introduced into the eye with a, an adenotype virus, and it's actually injected directly into the eye. And it actually is ridiculously expensive. It costs, costs $425,000 per eye, but it is thought to be a permanent fix uh, to this progressive blindness that is found in these patients. Last thing I'd like to talk about in this lecture is something called CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing. So uh, I'd like to explain a little bit about where this system originates, and then I'd like to talk about the possible uses. This is something that is often heard about in the news, and it's a very exciting way of changing or editing the genome of a living organism. So this is a virus defense system that is found normally in bacteria. So the way this works is that this bacteria has a region in its genome that contains a number of different parts. The first part is several Cas9 genes. These genes actually encode a number of proteins. If they are recruited to a region of the genome, they will actually cleave that nucleotide sequence. This region nearby is what I think of as the little book of bad things that this cell is keeping track of. So if this cell 
experienced a viral infection in the past in which it actually survived. What it will do is it will take a little part of that foreign DNA from the virus and actually insert it into this region of the genome. It inserts it between these repeat sequences that are shown by these black diamonds. And so, for example, this was the initial infection of this virus that had this red genome. And here, this cell that survived that infection kept a little region of that virus's genome to kind of keep track of that history and remember that this is a dangerous thing that might kill it in the future. So what happens once these spacer regions are filled with viral sequences is that this region is transcribed into RNA. The repeat region makes this little hairpin loop and then that's followed by the virus specific sequence. These get chopped into little pieces and that hairpin loop region is the binding site for a Cas9 nuclease. And so in the future then, if another virus happens to infect that particular cell, if that cell has a record of, that, of a past infection by a virus with that same sequence, then it is all ready to go. It has this little RNA, which is called a guide RNA, that was transcribed from this CRISPR locus, and it binds to a Cas9 nuclease, and it will actually go and base pair with the DNA that is inserted by that same virus, and it will immediately cleave it, thereby preventing that viral infection. Now this system was initially studied just because it is an interesting defense system that bacteria use against viruses, but some scientists who were learning about this had the really interesting idea that maybe this actually could be used for a different purpose. So one long-standing challenge in genetics has been making changes in genomes of living cells or of living organisms. This is really hard to do in a directed way. And people who were studying this CRISPR-Cas9 system had the idea that maybe they could transport the parts of this from bacteria into a mammalian cell and have it actually target a particular place in the genome to be changed. So in eukaryotic cells, there are very robust and well-studied mechanisms to repair damaged DNA. The idea of this is that if you bring in these two parts, the bacterial Cas9 protein and a guide RNA, which will direct that nuclease Cas9 to a particular region of the genome based on that sequence similarity where you would design that guide RNA to bind, then you could actually make that Cas9 nuclease make a double-stranded cut at a particular place in the genome. Now there are two different kinds of repair mechanisms in eukaryotic cells. This non-homologous end joining will actually just fix that break, but often it makes a little mutation in the process. And so if you were interested in breaking a particular gene, you might want to activate this particular system. The homology directed repair mechanism is a different type of repair. For this system, if you provide a copy of how you want that region of the genome to be fixed, the cell will actually use that information and fix that region of the genome to match what you provided as the example. And so not only would you be able to make mutations in particular genes, via the non-homologous end joining repair mechanism, but you would also be able to change the genome in very particular ways. For example, if there was a cell that had a mutation in a particular gene, just say an early stop codon in a gene, then possibly you could fix that mistake back to be the normal protein again. If you're interested in learning more about this very interesting technology, here's another video I recommend. And I just mentioned that in August 2017, the very first CRISPR therapy was approved by the FDA. 
And so this is for a type of childhood leukemia. And in this treatment, the patient's own T cells are actually removed and they're genetically changed to help them target and kill those leukemia cells.